Well, hello, this is Eric Topol with Ground Truce, and I am really thrilled to have with me uh, Katie Carrico, who uh, I think everyone knows, won the Nobel Prize with Drew Weissman in 2023. And she has written a sensational book. Uh, it's called Breaking Through. I love that title because it's a play on words of breakthrough and breaking through. And we have a lot to talk about, uh, Katie, so welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes. Well, I, I like to start off, as you did in the book, uh, with your background in Hungary, um, where, of course, you you started with a, a tough uh, background in a one-room house uh, without uh, running water, and you never had really exposures to scientists, and somehow or other, you um, became interested in science, and uh, you attributed some of these things like... Uh, your biology teacher, Mr. Toth, and the book, Stress of Life. And could you tell us a little bit more what, you know, stimulated you in a career of science? Um, I have to say that uh, every child is uh, interested in understanding the nature around them. And uh, so I was surrounded with nature because we had big garden, we had animals around, and it was an exciting thing. And and you know the children ask questions, and <laughs> if they try to find answer, and teachers or parents might give the answer. But um, definitely, the school was also, you know, even elementary school was very stimulating. Teachers, chemistry teacher, figure out how we can make crystals, and you know, I was so excited to have my own crystals and things <laughs> like that. And in high school, also that uh, you know the. The teachers were uh, so uh, engaging and uh, um, not like they try to put all of the information into your brain, but they encourage you to think yourself. And uh, so that's all contributed. And uh, I think that um, most of the child, you know, in the first, I don't know, six, seven years of their life, that how they can see their parents behaving, their friends, the school classmates and they shape that what kind of people they will be at the end and the rest of it you know is refining <laughs> right right well one of the things i loved uh, that you brought up in the book was uh, how much you liked the tv show colombo that's <laughs> one of my favorite tv shows of all time and uh one more thing one more thing can you talk a little bit about colombo i mean because in some ways you were like the Peter Falk of mRNA, you know, in terms of one more thing. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I um, realized also that we as researchers, you know, we are not called searchers, <laughs> you know, we researchers. So we are repeating, repeating things. And, uh, and so it was just, um, you know, I, 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 of course, everybody knows who committed the crime in, in Colombo because this is how it starts. So you don't have to figure out. But it seems always that, you know, things uh, in a dif different direction, you know, you would uh, lead. and But all the little clues. And uh, so some of my colleagues said that, you know, they, they also in a as a physician, they have this tunnel vision. So the patient comes and they can figure out mm, probably, you know, from some clues that, okay, this is the disease. And they get back the uh, lab results and others. And then they realize that one or two things is not fitting, but they always, you know, so strongly believe that their first instinct. And uh, so, but I taught them to <laughs> focus on those which will not fit because that will lead to the real perpetrator in the case of Colombo. And so it is, um, you know, I like the uh, simplicity, you know, it's not, uh, I know that what we are doing, this research is very overcomplicated, but we can break down in very simple question, yes or no, and then repeating things. And, and many experiments when I did like, you know, one was the experiments, really, the question, and the nine of them was like, you know, just controls. Always, the, I have to have a control for that, control for that. And since I work most of the time, you know, with my own hands myself, so I had to make sure that I think through that what will be the experimental outcome and then think about that 
do I have a control for that? So that many times I, in my brain, I before I performed the experiment, I in my brain I predicted that what will be the of course you know you never get the outcome what you expect, but at least you have the control that you can exclude a couple of things. And so this is how I function. Is usually in the twenty end of the twentieth century, twenty first century, people not work like I did alone mm. most of the time. But no, actually, what how you described it in the book um, was just so extraordinary, um, and it really was in keeping with this relentless um, interrogation uh, of, um, and that's what I want to get into um, is particularly the time when you came to the United States in 1985, and the labs that you worked in predominantly in Philadelphia. Uh, through that period before leaving uh, Penn to go on to uh, uh, BioNTech. Um, so you first kind of beached in at Temple University with uh, a monster, uh, at least as you portrayed him in the book. I mean, it was nice that he picked you up at the airport, uh, you you and your, your family. Um, uh, this is uh, Suhadon. How do you say his name? Suhadonik? Suhadonik. Suhadonik. Okay. But he not only was the lab, you know, kind of infested with cockroaches, but also um, when you, after working there for a number of years, a few years, you then uh, had gotten an offer to go to Johns Hopkins. And when you informed him about that, he threatened uh, and did everything he could to ruin your career and get you deported. I mean, this was just awful. How, how did you get through that? I, you know, I, um, as I mentioned later on, I went back and uh, gave a lecture there. And and I have to say that I always put positivity, you know, in forefront. So I learned a lot from him. And I, I you know, he invited me to America. So I, I was always very grateful. And he was kind and we did very well. And we did a lot of publication, you know, in one issue of biochemistry, we had three, three papers. And two of them, I was the first author. So I worked very hard. And and so he liked that, and he wanted me to stay there. And and uh, so, you know, I just uh, learned that uh, in from this Shaya book that, you know, this is what is given and then what I can do. I cannot change him. I cannot change the situation, how I can get out from it. And that's what I focused on. So I I, I am not uh, bitter about him. You know, I, I am. I liked him. And uh, the same other people, you know, I um, when I get an award, I usually, thanks to all of these people who try to make my life miserable, they made me work harder. And, uh, <laughs> well, but you, you were very kind, like you said, when you went back to Temple many years later to give the lecture, because what he did to you, I mean, he was so vindictive about you potentially leaving um, his lab, which he demanded that he be called the boss and he was going to basically, he ruined the Johns Hopkins job. He called them. I mean, and you were so nice and kind when you went back to give the lecture without, you know, saying a negative word about him. So I give you credit. You, you weren't at the, you know, when somebody goes low, you went high, right? Um, which is mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. And it is important, you know, which I learned from the Shea book also, that you don't carry any grudge against anybody because it will poison you. And uh, as, uh, you know, Shea also said that when you are very frustrated and very upset, the quickest way you can think about how you can release the stress is revenge. And he said, don't do that. It escalates. It hits you back. You have to think about how you can be grateful for the same person you were just ready to (laughs) to take some revenge. And that's what you have to practice. Sometimes, you know, it's difficult to feel that, but... uh, I don't have any uh, bad feeling against uh, my chairman who, you know, put my stuff on the hallway. Oh, because- oh, yeah, I was going to get to that. So then, you know, after a short stint uh, at the uh, Uniform University Health Science uh, where you had to drive three hours from Philadelphia to go there and you would sleep on the floor. And the, I mean, it's just I, I, I have to say, uh, Katie, if, if I was driving three hours, all I'd be thinking about is how desperate a situation I was put in by the, the prior uh, PI you work with. At any rate, you work there, and then finally you got a job with my friend Elliot Barnathan, a <laughs> cardiologist at University of Pennsylvania. So here you are, you're very interested in mRNA, 
and you hook up with Elliot, who's interested in plasminogen activators, and you work in his lab. And, um, you know, it's quite a story where one of the students in his lab, uh, David Langer, uh, ratted on you for being blunt about the experiments getting screwed up. And then later you wind up working, you know, in his lab. But um, tell me a bit about uh, the times with Elliot, because he's a very gracious, very, I think he was very supportive of your efforts and you got him stimulated about the potential for mRNA, um, it seems like. Yes, so I was uh, desperate to be away from my family at uh, Bethesda and uh, try to get back. And, uh, you know, every every day I sent out several uh, applications. This was in uh, 1989, so, you know, that you had to send letters. And, uh, and then, um, you know, I call up usually the secretaries that what's going on, and I call up also a secretary, and she said that uh, they were re advertise because nobody was good enough. And I said, can you look, can you ask him to look at again my application? And then, you know, half an hour later, Elliot called me back that come and bring your notebook. He wanted to know what kind of experiment I am doing. And mm -hmm. he opened when I came a couple of days later and, you know, pull up a northern blot, and he said, you have done that? I said, yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> and he, he said, okay, you are, you are higher than the, so that, uh, because Elliot is just a couple of days younger than me. So I convinced him that we should, we should do a uh, kind of MRNA research and, um, and he agreed and uh, we did the, uh, uh, several experiments and he, he helped me, uh, you know, to get all of these, uh, experiments ongoing and, uh, so it was very exciting time, and uh, I listen. You know, Elliot was there in many award ceremony, including the Nobel Prize. He was my guest because I was very grateful to him. Because uh, I have to say that um, he he tried to protect me, and uh, he he get uh, trouble for that because uh, you know in the higher up. And, um, you know, when he was looking for tenure, somehow he get the uh, RO1, several of them, but they did not put him tenure because he was, you know, <laughs> standing up for me and he paid the price. So I do you think the reason in part that he went to CenterCore, a biotech company who I work with quite extensively, was because he stood up for you? Uh, he he mentioned to the chairman that he's waiting for whether he will be tenured because he has a job offer from, uh, you know, with the Rio Pro, what he was doing there, you know, in the lab and, and testing out. And, uh, and the chairman told him that, take that job. Yeah, well, you know, that's interesting because I know Judy Swain very well. <laughs> and she did everything she could to hurt your career. She demoted you. Or actually, she wanted you to leave, but you wound up taking a demotion. Um, and also, Bill Kelly, who I know well, he was the dean and CEO of the whole pen. Did he ever get any direct involvement with, because, you know, much later on, he was advocating for your recognition. But during that time, he could have told Judy Swain to stop this. But did he ever get involved, do you know? You know, I was very low level of nobody, so he would not, you know. Yeah. It was interesting. We were hired on the same day in 1989. Yeah. August first, and I I met him Bill Kelly when the new faculty was uh, hired, and uh, I was so happy because I and my first project in Hungary was Leshnyan syndrome, and I know that he discovered the gene. Yes, yes. And I was uh, you know looking up to him very much always. Well, you said in the book uh, you're over the moon, and I have to say you know I worked with him. My first job was at University of Michigan. Oh. And I worked with him for six years before he left to go to Penn. And uh, we've been friends, you know, uh, all these years. But, uh, you know, uh, what what happened with Judy Swain, as I read in the book, I got all, it bristled. I, you know, I really was upset to read about that. Anyway, uh, somehow you you stayed on, Elliot moved. By, by the way, you, you during that time with Elliot, you were able to get mRNA uh, to make uh, your your kinase plasminogen activator, UPA, and that was a, a step in the right direction. But I, I, before we leave Elliot, if you had stayed there, if he had gotten tenure, do you think you would have ultimately together made the discovery that you did with Drew Weissman? 
I couldn't be tenured because it is a clinical department and I had a PhD and nobody at clinical department can be, but I could have been a research associate professor if uh, I can uh, get a grant. And, um, uh, you know, in uh, 90, 1993, I already had a submitted grant on circular RNA. When these people <laughs> in these days, they say that, oh, that's a novelty. Oh. Oh, I, I, in 90, 94, 95, I had several grants uh, on circular RNA I submitted for therapeutic purposes. So I, you know, and Elliot helped me with English and the computer, everything what he could. And <clears throat> But uh, uh, it is important that uh, he was not immunologist and I needed yeah, uh, yeah. You know, discovery. I, I, when I work with him, uh, I did not realize the mRNA was inflammatory. Right, right, exactly. We're going to get to that in a minute. Now, after you, after Elliot left, then you needed someone else to support you, and you wound up with, as I mentioned earlier, David Langer, a neurosurgeon who you previously knew, and he also stood up for you, right? Yes, yes. So at the beginning, you know, every lab, when you have a medical student, they are kind of, you know, over. Yes, they know everything. And, um, you know, and one day he just told me that, uh, Katie, you know, I will want to learn everything what you know, and I will know everything you know. I said, oh, by that time, you know, I when you are learning, I learn so much more. You never catch me, you know. That always I had to put him back, <laughs> and uh, and so, but kind of, you know, he liked that how I worked. I concentrate. I didn't chit chat, and and then he was just, um, you know, keep coming back when I was working even with Eli- Elliot, and he advanced from medical student to residency and so on. And and then when he learned that uh, I have uh, no job because Elliot is leaving, then he went to uh, Eugene Flam, the chairman of uh, neurosurgery, and uh, he convinced him that, uh, yeah, uh, neurosurgery needs a molecular biologist. That's what he was arguing. And Thanks to David and the, the chairman, Eugene Flem. Then for 17 years, I had a laboratory and I had a financial support. Not yeah, much. Then, yeah, I mean, that was great. But again, you were not getting you know any real support from the university. And then all of a sudden, you show up one day and Sean has all your lab, everything of, that you worked on, throw it in the hallway. I mean, that's just incredible story, right? Uh, well, at any rate, you then wound up, uh, because you were basically hawking uh, mRNA as a, as a path of science that's going to be important. By the way, my favorite quote in the book, Katie. Yes. The, the history of science, it turns out, is filled with stories of very smart people laughing at good ideas. I, I just love that quote. Um, and it kind of exemplifies, you know, your your career and your success. But you were steadfast, and um, you ran in, of course, the famous story to Drew Weissman at the Xerox machine, and you were hawking, you know, trying to anybody to believe in, as you called it, led to the mRNA Believers Club, which only a handful of people in the world uh, ever got there. And here you have, you take on something that, you know, obviously 1960 in your lifetime, early in your lifetime, it was discovered, but everyone knew it was was unstable, very difficult to work with, very challenging. Of course, that you realize that could be beneficial. But you hooked up with Drew, the immunologist that you mentioned. um, And I didn't know, by the way, he had type 1 diabetes. I learned that from your book. And the both of you worked so hard. And I mean, it's just really incredible. But while you're at Penn, the famous or infamous Jesse Gelsinger case and his death uh, occurred. And he had the cytokine release syndrome. And you learned from that, right? Uh, yes. Uh, by that time, we also could see that the RNA uh, could be inflammatory. But in his case, of course, because the virus was causing it or what certain condition caused that. But um I have to say that um, so so people work at uh, uh, gene therapy at uh, Pan and uh, mostly of viral pro, pro, uh, programs. And uh, when I mentioned I tried to make gene therapy with mRNA, of course, you know everybody felt 
sorry for me, poor copy. It was <laughs> hate RNA, it's always degrade. But I have to say the degradation is coming mostly because the laboratory, molecular biology laboratory, they use plasmid. And when they isolate it plasmid, like the quiogen kit, they start with the RNAs. They add RNAs because you have to eliminate the bacterial RNA. And they contaminate the whole laboratory, the refrigerator door, the GL apparat, everybody's RNAs. And uh, so that's what, you know, extra problem with uh, working with RNA. But um, uh, so I um, could make RNA and uh, so it was working and uh, so kind of, um, you know, try to <laughs> express that. And I, I did, uh, I, I made a lot of RNA for people. Probably they still have in their freezer, never tested because I was a pusher, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, what was fascinating, of course, is you had already learned in mice about this inflammation from putting mRNA in vivo. And then you made the uh, remarkable discovery, uh, which was the paper in immunity that had been rejected by Nature and many other papers, even though you had been told, you know, if you could get a paper in Nature, maybe that could help your career, right? And, um, you know, back in 2021, the journal Immunity, uh, a very highly regarded cell press journal, they asked me to comment on your discovery. And I, I wrote, you may have seen it. Yeah, I, of course, several people wrote, uh, Tony Fauci and others. But yeah. what I wrote was what began what, what began, began as a replacement for a uridine base to squash an inflammatory response in mice into the uh, evolved into the basis for a broad therapeutic platform to fight both communicable and non-communicable diseases in people. So this discovery that you made in, the, in that classic 2005 paper, which is the most important paper ever published in the journal Immunity, uh, was the toll-like receptor was mediating the inflammation. And if you change the uridine to pseudouridine, you could essentially blunt or block the inflammation. This was a seminal discovery that opened up mRNA as but not just for COVID, of course, but for so many pathogens. And as we'll talk about when we wrap up about all these other things. So when you got, when you did this paper and Drew said, you know, when it's published, it, the phones are going to be ringing off the hook and no one even acknowledged the paper, right? I mean, no one realized how, how this was one of the most important discoveries in the history of biomedicine, right? Yes, especially knowing that <laughs> Drew is not a person who is, uh, you know, uh, exaggerating things. Uh, Drew is very, you know, uh, modest and uh, would not say such a things. You know, I am more like, oh, or maybe this happened, you know, but he is not like that. And I, I got the one invitation to go to the Rockefeller University and a meeting. And then one in, I went to uh, Japan to to. Uh, from 2005, and it was 2006, both of them. Mm -hmm. That was invitation. And nothing happened in seven and 2008 and 2009. Yeah, but those those meetings that you went to, they were kind of obscure, like, you know, microcosm groups. I mean, they were relevant to your work, but they didn't realize this is a big deal. I mean, this is, this is like a, a world changing type of uh, finding uh, because, you know, now you could deliver th things in cells. Now, of course, you worked on this for three decades and the people that think you know, that think that um, you can do a flash in the pan in science. Yeah. No, but, but at the same time, nanoparticles separately were being pursued. How important were the nanoparticles to make for the package for the ultimate success, uh, when when uh, COVID hit in late night 2019, and now you had been working, you know, at, at BioNTech, uh, how would you rate the the importance of the nanoparticles in the story? For for the vaccine, definitely the is important because uh, you know everybody asks the mRNA if not immunogenic, where do you have the adjuvant? Where is the adjuvant? And then. Uh, lipid nanoparticle contains an ionizable lipid, which was the adjuvant. And uh, why it is important that not the mRNA was inducing the response, because the mRNA induced interferon. And if you have interferon, then follicular T helper cells is not formed, and then you get a very low amount of antibodies. But if you do not induce 
interferon, but you induce IL-6 and other cytokines, you know, is beneficial to have high level of antibodies. So that's what the ionized over lipid uh, was causing, and that's the adjuvant in the lipid nanoparticle. Yes, I always emphasize that it was very, it is very important. And uh, of course, when we use for um, the particle that was tolerization, then it did not contain ionizable. Right, so. right. And I think that's where there's a misconception because because of the the Nobel Prize recognition um, last year, a lot of people think, well, that's all tied only to the COVID vaccine. But actually, no, your discovery was much bigger than that. And it was applied for the COVID vaccine, you know, of course, with the nanoparticle package. But yours is, uh, as we'll get to in a moment, you know, much, much bigger. Now, um, so we, you have then spent, uh, you left Penn, uh, that was in 2013, 13. and then you spent that, uh, several years in Mainz, Germany, working with uh, the folks at BioNTech, and you really enjoyed that. And they appreciated you then, as opposed to what you dealt with at Penn, where, you know, it was just that you kept hearing about the dollars per net square footage and all these ridiculous things. And it's just extraordinary to go back there. But now um, I just want to mention uh, about your own gene transfer, your daughter. Your daughter uh, is a two-time gold medal Olympiad in rowing, which is incredible. So she didn't go down the path of science, but she also, you know, became a, a world leader in a field. Um, is that is that a transmitted on a particular chromosome in the family? I, I think that she just could see that, you know, you have to focus on something and then you give up many things and you focus and then achieve. And then you get the new goal, set up a new goal. And uh, I mean, she get uh, some articulated at Penn, so she get a master in science and later in UCLA, she get a uh, MBA degree. So but uh, 10 years, she was like, you know, for me, is a very boring thing. Just, you know, rowing, going backwards. I said, isn't that, isn't that boring every day? And she, she said, no, mom, you know, it is fun. Every practice is different. I enjoy it. The minute I don't enjoy I will stop doing it. Yeah, so, well, it's an amazing story about Susan. And, uh, of course, you know, the, the expansion of your family with a grandchild and everything else that you wrote about in the book. So now let's go to um, this story, the big story here, which is mRNA. Now you can get into cells, you can deliver just about anything. Uh, so it now it can be used for genome editing. Uh, it can be used for all these different pathogens as vaccines, um, and including not just pathogens, but potentially, obviously, cancer to rev up Im Im uh, the immune system. Uh, neurodegenerative disease to prevent these uh, processes, uh, potentially even preventing cancer uh, in the few years ahead. So, how do you see this platform evolving uh, in in the in the years ahead? Uh, you already have seen many vaccines getting approval uh, or under intense study for pathogens, but that just seems like the beginning, right? Yes, yes. Uh you know, when I came Penn, the major advantage was uh, going to lectures. And when I went to the lectures, I always end of it, I think, oh, mRNA would be good for it. So I was collecting all of these different fields. And then what happens is right now, I can see the companies are uh, making those RNA, which, you know, I thought that it would be useful and even more many, many more things that they are applying. And, and now it is up to those specialists, you know, to, to figure out. They don't need me, you know. They need uh, experts on cardiology and uh, other fields and uh, uh, allergies also. There is uh, also to tolerate allergies. And so that so many fields, the scientists will be figuring out there that what, what is useful for the mRNA and they can just order now and or create their own RNA and test it out. You know, it's actually pretty amazing because I don't know where we'd be right now if you had not been pushing this against all adversity. I mean, just being suppressed uh, <laughs> and being 
told, you know, put your stuff out in the hallway or be being t- thrown out of the university and you not being able to get any grants, which is amazing throughout all this time, not being able to get grants. It tells a big story. Uh, and that's why the book is so sensational because it takes, it's obviously your autobiography, but it, it tells a story that is so important. It goes back to that memorable quote that I, I mentioned. I, I also want to, you know, you, you wrap up the book with your message um, of your of your life story. And I do want to read a bit of that and, and then get your reaction, okay? My first message is this. We can do better. I believe we can improve how science is done at academic research institutions. For one thing, we might create a clearer distinction between markers of prestige titles, publication records, number of citations, grant funding, committee appointments, etiquette, dollars per net square footage, and those of quality science. Um, Too often we conflate the two, and if there's one, as if there's one and the same. But a person isn't a better scientist because she publishes more or first. Perhaps she's holding back from publication because she wants to be absolutely certain of her data. Similarly, the number of citations might have little to do with the value of the paper and more to do with external events. When Drew and I published our landmark immunity paper, and indeed it was, it barely got any notice. It took a pandemic for the world to understand what we'd done and why it mattered. I mean, that's profound, Katie, profound. I have to run. Uh, tell you that uh, what I could see is the uh, as science progress, every scientist starts with the understanding something to help the world and some, but somehow, and they publish because they have something to say, but somehow it's shifted. Now we want more money, more people would come. Oh, those, those people had to get publication because otherwise they cannot graduate. They need first author paper. They publish even when it is not finished or nothing to say. And then somehow the focus is uh, uh, promotion, you are advancing your position, and the tool is, you know, doing the experiments. And if, if you see, you know, I was demoted, I was pushed out, kicked out. So if I, my goal would have been, you know, to, you know, to see that uh, I am advancing, then it was, uh, you know, I would give up because uh, that's what the problem is. So that uh, focus is going away from from the original thing that we want to understand the science. Because if you want to understand the science, you are even happy when you can see a publication doing half of what you have done already. Because you say, I wanted to understand, oh, here is a paper. They did a similar thing. I did, okay. you know. But the people think, oh my God, my top tier journal paper is out and my promotion is out because they, they discovered and they published before me. So that's, uh, that's the problem. Well, I mean, if, if I had made a list of all the adversity that you faced from, you know, growing up in uh, the Russian communist run Hungary to, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming to the U.S., the not even knowing the language and also, you know, have all the sacrifices you made along the way with your family. And when you, when you would go to... Uh, Bethesda, or when you move to Mines, or I mean, all along the whole time, no less with the university or Temple or Penn. I mean, the list is very long, and somehow you you prevailed above all that, which is it's just so startling. But another thing I want to just get into briefly, as you know, um, this has been uh, a, a shocking um, counter movement to the vaccines and giving ridiculously, you know, the mRNA as a, a bad name. But in the book, you, you've, you kind of had a, um, a, a way to foreshadow this. Because back in the 1968 pandemic uh, that you obviously experienced, you, here you talked about that. You said, um, we restricted our movement, limiting our contact with others. We scrubbed. We disinfected. I suppose the party encouraged this, but nobody complained about government overreach. This was a virus. It had no ideology, no political agenda. 
if we weren't careful, it would spread. Then we would all suffer. These were just the facts. That's how viruses work. So how come we still don't know that? That was 1968 in Hungary. And here we are in the United States and we have a huge movement, anti-vaccine, anti-mRNA, COVID vaccines. And it's very worrisome because all the great science is threatened by this mis and disinformation. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, I heard that, uh, you know, virus, viruses, they love democracy because everybody can do whatever they want, you know, <laughs> whereas, you know, in other countries, <laughs> give an give a order, everybody has to have vaccine and then, you know, that's different. But um, yes, uh, I, I understand that the, the novelty, the people uh, were always against. Even when X-ray was introduced, people thought that, oh, people will look through my clothes seeing me naked because they take part of the truth and they don't say, oh, maybe through the flesh is going through and I can see somebody's bone or something, you know. And, and, and then they distort and they create a fear. And if you f- make fear, then you can control, you know, like... Uh, uh, Lord of the fly, you know, <laughs> somebody you are afraid of and then you can control. And uh, you can be afraid of the virus or you can be afraid of the uh, vaccine. And then that's what I, I don't understand. Uh, exactly. Drew said that when they investigated those who are spreading most of these uh, uh, news about uh, uh, against the vaccine is uh, they are selling some kind of products, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Benefiting, just like you know, hundred years ago, those uh, uh, who were afraid that they can see through their clothes, you know, the, some uh, um, they start to sell uh, X-ray resistant underwear. Of course, you know, people, <laughs> but you know, they made money, made, yeah. made money on the people's fear. Yeah. That's, uh, and I don't know that how to how to fight it, or you know, I. I think that uh, the honesty when the scientists would say that, listen, we don't know today how it spread. This is how uh, we suggest be afraid, wash everything. Oh, no, we know that it is in the air so that, um, okay, you don't have to wash your clothes when you go to out and come back. But, you know, don't go crowded places in politics. Is not working because it is like wishy-washy. To, yesterday you said something and today. But because we learn, you know, they have to understand this is a science process constantly correcting. In politician, oh, I know everything. This is how to do. You know, they want to reflect this um, confidence. That's what it is. And yeah. that's why yeah. everywhere mixed up with this, you know, some leaders want to reflect this confidence and they do things, you know, which uh, uh, helps the virus to spread. Right. Well, I'm glad to get your perspective because obviously when you work so hard throughout your career and then you see the backlash that's unwarranted, uh, it's always good to be circumspect, of course. But to say that this was done in a flash in a pan and it's, you know, never really te- it's gene therapy and, you know, uh, it's changing your DNA. I mean, it's a lot of crazy things that, of course, that you brought out um, uh, in the book as well. Now, um, before wrapping up, uh, you wrote the book before you were awarded the Nobel Prize. And um, this recognition, you and Drew, of course, uh, became, uh, you know, fantastic. You so richly deserved. But many things occurred. And I wanted to ask you, for example, you did your PhD and your postdoc at the University of Szeged in uh, Hungary, and you went back there. Um, and I think you were celebrated in your in your <laughs> university. Um, perhaps the first Nobel laureate. I, I don't know. I would imagine perhaps the second. The second. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but also, you know, you you became you know the last thing, of course, that you was recognized in the book. It was it was a much uh, different thing. It was like the Time One Hundred recognition. But now that you have had, you know, many of these uh, unanticipated awards, um, of course, um, what what are your thoughts about that? I mean, it, it's wonderful, of course, to get recognized by the university that you trained uh, and the people that you know that you you grew up with. Um, 
what what has this changed your life or is it really very very much the same as it was my life is very same you know as it was i am living in the same house i we moved in 89 and uh, okay last year i get a new car up until then i never had only just i had some beat up <laughs> last year I purchased my first new car and uh, but that's luxury you know when you are 68 years old <laughs> you could afford and um, this is you know i tried you know, it was everything surprise because for 40 years I never get any award and the first award I get 2021. Yeah. And, and, um, and it was, uh, you know, this, I tried to, uh, some, something to articulate and, and, uh, you know, more people, uh, Life as a scientist is similar to mine. You know, they are immigrant. They are not recognized. And, you know, I try to tell them just not to focus on things, you know, like the university is not grateful. Who is the university? Just they are walls. What what the administrator would tap your shoulder? You have to know that what you are doing is important. And if you push around, you always have to, what Shaya said, figure out what you can do. Always that. Not that what they should do, you know, the agency should give me the money. The boss should, uh, you know, the superior should help me. No, I cannot uh, make other people to do. I have to figure out what I can do. I can write better and better and rewrite, uh, you know, generate more data for a submitted grant application. And, and always, that's why, you know, all of these naysayers made me better. Right. Because I'm not focused on you know, revenge or anger, but always, okay, how can I be better? Mm. Now, so that gets me to what, what you do next. I know you're an avid reader. I know you read, you you read so much about science and your field and, and broader, of course. Uh, I take it you still are doing that. But um, uh, what, what's, what's in the next chapter for you? Because I can't imagine you're ever going to rest. No, no, I, I, I will be six feet under when I can rest, I realize now. But uh, it is just that uh, you are uh, on a different field and you understand uh, um, like uh, nucleotides, how the naturally you make RNA, the, what is the transporters, what is, the, what is happening in the mitochondria, so the different things, you know, that... Uh, iron sulfur clusters, and then you start to investigate. Like three months, I was just reading one topic. Okay, I didn't even know that. I didn't even. And how, uh, you know, in my life, I was reading so many things. I realized there are so many diseases. I understand what is the reason. People don't. And uh, I went, uh, you know, when I was at Penn to different uh, people, professors, about my idea for certain diseases. But I was nobody, and um, nobody listened. No, I am somebody. I have to be very careful because I say a name of the disease. People will line up here and say, don't talk to Eric. Go and do something. Help us. And so that's what I try to help. You know, right. I think that I understand certain uh, disease which is so enigmatic and nobody has a clue. And uh, maybe I have a solution for that. And that, that's what I try to do now. Uh, do you ever go to Penn? Do you ever go to... Work in there? No, I I don't. When when you are forced to retire, and you know, I was I knew that they would throw me out because it was t- 2012, right before Christmas. I was told that get out because you didn't get the 2012. Last time I submitted my uh, an mRNA for stroke therapy, still very valid and good idea. But anyway, I knew that I will be pushed out, and um, but you know, I, I don't have grudge. Even uh, the chairman, he how I can expect the neurosurgeon who is doing the operation, he just can see that I did not get the funding and those people who make the decision that my proposal is not good, they are experts. He's not an expert. He just can see. This is what the expert said. Yeah. I don't have, you know, I talked well, to him. I, 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 you know, I don't uh, blame much, anybody. Good for you. I mean, I think it's much easier to be vindictive and you have to, you know, to, to have the philosophy that you have, which is not to hold any grudges after all that has basically been done to you for 
by many people along the way. And we, I think we've covered that. I, I know this is a very different uh, interview, perhaps, than many others that you've had. I didn't bring up the teddy bear and I didn't bring up a lot of things that, you know, others have brought up because they've already been covered. I wanted to get into what you had to endure, what you had to do to persevere and how it has changed the life science and medicine forever. And now, you know, still today, the mRNA package will be improved. I mean, we've already learned, for example, the the change of the two proline substitution that uh, Andrew Ward at my place, along with Jason McClellan and others, yes. to make it to better immune response, it can be improved with a 6P proline substitution. We can beat nature just like you did with the, ur- the pseudouridine substitution. And the nanoparticles will improve. And this whole package has got an incredible future. But it's thanks to you for not having, if, if, it, if it induced massive inflammation, it never would have been possible. Yes. I, I always said that, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of scientists, uh, I thanks, you know, every time I thanks them, those people even not with us, just I was reading their papers and, and it all contributed to, to this, uh, you know, to this development and learning. And so I am... Uh, not thinking that I was, you know, many, many other people together, we did that. Well, I am so indebted to you as I, everyone who understands science is. Uh, and it's, of course, a bigger story than mRNA. It's what you, what you endured and how you persevered and against all odds. I mean, truly against all odds. So thank you. Yeah. Did, I, did I miss anything that I should have asked you about? No, I, I have to say, you know, the book came out and now I can see in uh, different social media that how uh, other scientists get, uh, you know, inspired. I yes. was reading one that, who said that quit uh, doing PhD and uh, she read my book and she cried, she laughed and she went back. She right. realized that, you know, uh, there is more to it, you know, because uh, so many is uh, uh, expecting some you know, uh, doing some work and, and then there will be some rewards. But, you know, the rewards is, this is, this is not a, you know, a short distance. <laughs> this is a marathon, you know, to right. be a scientist. And, and you have to see the goals and it will one day. And, and you might not the one that crossed first the finish line, but you are helping others. And that's what is important. And that's what I am glad that I, work with this and write this book uh, so that uh, other scientists more can associate because they they feel the same way that they are not appreciated they are not things are not going as expected and and then they might be inspired to not to give up and that's what uh, also an important uh, message well you know I, that's why i love the book because it is so inspirational and it will make people cry <laughs> uh, it, it will uh, make people commit to science or appreciate it more than ever. I, 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 I don't know if you saw it, but I put it as my 10 favorite books for 2023. And it, it, indeed, I could have been the most favorite in many respects. So I hope more people listening um, or watching the video will read the book because it has a lot. I'm so glad you wrote it, Katie, because if we only knew you from, you know, papers and Nobel Prize, you wouldn't know the true story. We wouldn't know, you know, really what your life has been like uh, over these many decades. So thank you for that as well. And thank you uh, for the, from the life science, the medical community, and, you know, for everyone, um, for all that you've done to change the future and the current state of medicine. Yeah, thank thank you very much, asking and and I might add to the book that the book is published in many different languages. It's coming Italian, French, German, Thai, Japanese, Chinese. So scientists all over the world can read their native language, and maybe they are in, will be inspired. Oh, I have no question about that. Um, it's a story that it should be a movie, um, so that everyone, the people that won't read the book, will hopefully watch the movie. Has there already been a plan for that? Uh, there was, but I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, they have this um, uh, strike and uh, during the summer. Oh, okay. 
it and I don't know where it stands. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets done in the future. And I hope they'll consult with you, not just read the book. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting who they find, who they get to play you in the movie. But thank you so much, Katie. What a joy. And I look forward to future visits with you.